We're, we're going to look at apostolic history tonight. And so tonight, I want us to look at the DNA of the apostolic church. We're going to go down a journey of finding the DNA of the apostolic church. How many is interested in where you came from? Now, I made mention a few moments ago about what we often refer to as the Azusa Street Revival. Uh, let, let's start the slides, Ashley. Put them up there. I want to get everybody on the same page. What happened started in what was Topeka, Kansas. A man began to seek the Holy Ghost and the power of God began to pour out. Wound up, Brother William Seymour, wound up in Los Angeles at the Bonnie Bray House. They call it the Bonnie Bray House because it was on Bonnie Bray Street. Bonnie Bray, they would gather together and begin to pray. The Holy Ghost began to fall. That's where the term Holy Rollers came from. How many's ever heard the term Holy Roller? The reason the term Holy Roller was ascribed to these people is because if you've been to the Bonnie Bray House in Los Angeles, it's on a steep hill. It's literally almost as high as the curtains up there, and it's a very steep hill, just a very short front yard. And at that time, it was a dirt street with a little dirt path and steps up to it. But so many people started coming to the Bonnie Bray House because revival was breaking out and people were receiving the Holy Ghost that they would gather in and there was not room and they would spill out onto the porch. And when the Holy Ghost would hit them, many times they fell off the porch. And because it was a steep hill, they rolled all the way down the hill. And so people began to mock them and make fun of them. The Holy Ghost outpouring began in what was 1906 at Azusa Street. And that was where the term Holy Rollers came from. It didn't mean everybody rolled on the floor. That's where the term originally came from. But uh, most of the time when you hear Pentecostals, refer to their history. We're in the, we're in the science lab here and we're investigating. When you hear that your, your uh, roots as Pentecostals, this is where people go back to. They go back to Azusa and uh, all of the, the majority of Pentecostal denominations and organizations, they go back to what was the revival on Azusa Street in Los Angeles. And it was here that Brother William Seymour began to preach and, and began to preach behind a, a, a fruit box and he made it his pulpit and it would turn into prayer meetings and for several years there was a great revival and people came from all over the world and wrote about this strange phenomenon and, and uh, so on and so forth. But most people trace, they say, well, that's where Pentecost started. Well, you and I know that's not where Pentecost started. But I will admit it is a major focal point for Pentecostalism, especially here in the United States. But Pentecost actually began in your New Testament in Acts chapter 2. On the day of Pentecost, when it was fully come, something happened in an upper room. They were there and they were praying and seeking and they were waiting for the promise of the Father that Jesus said, go to Jerusalem and wait. And on that day of Pentecost, suddenly there came a sound from heaven and it filled all the house where they were sitting. And there appeared unto them cloven tongues like as a fire and it set upon each of them and they all were filled with the Holy Ghost. Anybody know what I'm talking about when I talk about Acts chapter 2? Is there anybody that knows your Pentecostal today that received the Holy Ghost. Amen. So we go all the way back. That's, that's the roots. That's the DNA. That's our foundation. Azusa Street was not the beginning, but if I could say it this way, it was a major sighting. It was a major booming. It was a major fire that began to blaze. But it was not the first time that it had happened. We know that Acts chapter 2 had happened. And then we see other places in the book of Acts that it happened. But what you may not know is that there had been Holy Ghost outpourings even in America prior to Topeka, Kansas and prior to Azusa Street. In the 1890s, there was a large group of Scandinavian people in the state of Minnesota and also in the Dakotas that experienced a major outpouring of the Holy Ghost. On one farm in Grafton, North Dakota, the power of the Holy Ghost hit and people received the Holy Ghost. In my master's study program, uh, I had the privilege of studying in Springfield, Missouri. And there in a prayer chapel, our professor took us into the prayer chapel. And over in the, 
on the side of the prayer chapel was a very old pulpit. And the professor said, I want to show you this pulpit. And we said, okay, you know, we're, we're theological students. We've seen a lot of pulpits. And he said, the reason I want you to see this pulpit is because this is the pulpit in such and such a church in North Dakota in 1896, I believe it was, that the preacher stood up on a Friday night in a prayer meeting and, he, and they began to pray. And suddenly, as they were praying, he said, suddenly it was like a wind filled the whole house. And every person in the auditorium fell out and was slain in the spirit. And at one time, they all began to speak with other tongues. So this was prior to 1906. This was 10 years prior. And then, uh, as, as history records, there were things that happened like a man by the name of George Showman, who was from Poland in the 1600s. He was a part of a group that was called the Polish Brethren. And you begin to look at what happened in his system of faith. There was the revelation of Jesus' name, baptism, that was taking place in the 1600s in Poland. So the apostolic message didn't just begin in Azusa or Elton, Louisiana, when they got to praying at a high school and began to pray for the revelation of baptism, and then they got to baptizing uh, uh, over down in Los Angeles after Azusa. There there were apostolic uh, meetings that were taking place even hundreds of years before Azusa Street. A man by the name of Francis Cornwell in England in the 1600s preached the message of Acts 2.38 not only tongue-talking experience but he also preached the necessity of Jesus' name baptism here's a name that all of you should know or at least remember when I mention it anybody ever heard of a guy named William Penn William Penn was from England and he was a a part of a group that were known as the Quakers you've heard of the Quakers Uh, He was part of a group of men. He actually signed his name to a writing, a book that was called The Sandy Foundation Shaken. And it was about false doctrine and a better way of life. And it was a, it was a denouncing of the Trinity. Because he said that's not accurate. There's no place for Trinity in the Word of God. And he was ascribing a different form of baptism. But because he had signed his name to it, he was arrested and was placed in the Tower of London. Well, because uh, the king owed so much money to William Penn's father, he was released. And, and uh, in the process, he, they said, you don't believe in the Trinity? Then, then you deny the deity of Jesus Christ? He said, no, I don't deny the deity of Jesus Christ. So they said, well, that's a compromise. We'll accept that. So they released him from prison. The money was owed. And so as time went by, William Penn was given the right to settle in the new, in the new world, a new area that would become no, named after him, the state of Pennsylvania. The reason he was allowed to do that was because everybody talks about the freedom of religion in America. Well, there was two groups that weren't really allowed at a certain point. They didn't want Catholics there and they didn't want Jews there. Well, there was this whole process having to do with baptism and William Penn was given the ability to go found what would later become Pennsylvania. But if you really study the founding of Pennsylvania, it was because he was offering a new way of baptism. And there was a large gathering of the Anabaptists, or another term for them was the rebaptizers. So when we talk about apostolic doctrine, we talk about the apostolic church, let me just tell you in this DNA study of apostolic church history, we are not the new kids on the block. In case anybody's ever told you that, everybody likes to talk about Azusa Street and this new thing called Pentecostalism. Let me tell you something. Pentecost. And apostolic Pentecost is the original deal. There were, there were other names. There are other names that if you take the time to study as I have, Thomas Bal- uh, Bolding, uh, William Richards, uh, Isaac Watson. Here's one that maybe you maybe didn't know about. Uh, her name is Emily Todd. Emily Todd was the cousin of Mary Todd. Does anybody know who Mary Todd was? Mary Todd was Abraham Lincoln's wife. And Emily Todd actually lived in the White House with them. And when people tried to say, well, you know, the White House is not meant to be, you know, a guest quarters. Well, Mary Todd got upset and took on the press and everybody else. Well, the interesting thing about Emily Todd is you may not have known is she was baptized in Jesus' name. And 
There are some records that maybe even indicate that Abraham Lincoln may have been. I'm not sure. I can't debate that. But we do know that Emily Todd was. But what's interesting is her ancestor had settled in the state of Pennsylvania. So when we talk about apostolic doctrine, it goes beyond Azusa Street. Pentecost experience goes beyond Azusa Street. And apostolic doctrine in Jesus' name baptism is not a new development. And so what, what I think we need to do, I, I know we shout, I know we run, and we, we talk about healing, and we talk about uh, marriages, and we talk about family, and we talk about Holy Ghost and world mission, but, but every once in a while we need to stop and look at who we are and where we came from. Is that all right? So let's look at the DNA of our apostolic church history. Acts chapter 2, the birth of the church, the outpouring of the Spirit. And the flame that was lit in Acts chapter 2 not only continues to burn today, but I want to make it very clear. And by the time I'm done tonight, I hope that I can convince you that the apostolic message was never silent. There has never been a day since Acts chapter 2 where the message of Jesus' name baptism was not preached and the message of the infilling of the Holy Ghost was not preached. There has always been a church since Acts chapter 2. Don't you let anybody tell you any different. By the time we're done, I want to show you that this apostolic church is the original. Now, you say, well, Brother Young, that's cool, so show it to me, all right? You know about the 12 apostles, and you know about Azusa Street, and you know about Elton, Louisiana, and you know about the time you got baptized in Jesus' name, and you know about the Rock Church, but what happened between Acts chapter 2, or more specifically, what happened when the book of Revelation closed Until you got here. What happened? It's like 2,000 years. Something happened. How did we get here? Well, you could probably name the 12. But what happened after them? Well, there are names like Noetus and Praxius and Artemon and Sibelius and many others. That may not come so readily to your mind. And then there are large groups of people that because we don't talk about it a lot, and many of their records and books and writings were destroyed during the Inquisition of Rome. Maybe you don't know about the Manichaeans and the Marcionites and the Artemites and the Donatists and the Somastes and on and on. And These were people that historically, it's as if somebody got, Dr. Ballmeister, you know what I'm talking about, it's as if somebody got an eraser and tried to revise history. Well, we know about that, don't we? They tried to take out what was really there. And the reason they were able to do it is because of situations that we'll look at. But one of the biggest reasons was because they were slandered as heretics. If you did not espouse the religion that was accepted in those days, you were slandered and labeled as a heretic. And the reason they were labeled as heretics is because they refused to be Romanized. What do I mean by that? Well, let me say, don't underestimate apostolic doctrine. God has always had a people. And so as you read your church history books, don't just negate the little, what did somebody call us, the murky backwater bunch? That's what they labeled us. That's nothing new. That's modern terms. But before that, they they were a little more blunt. They called us heretics. And so if you can paint everybody as a heretic or paint everybody as a murky backwater bunch and push them off to the side and say, they don't have any truth, they're just a bunch of nuts, and then you you follow another pattern of history, everybody just seems to believe it. Time has a way. Let, Let me prove to you. How many believe a guy named Shakespeare ever lived? Let me see your hand. You believe that, don't you? Prove it to me. Well, I've read his writings. No, you haven't. You've never read one original text by Shakespeare because they don't exist. Am I telling the truth? Not one original manuscript by Shakespeare has ever been found. There's not one around. All we have is copies of what he supposedly wrote. And people believe Shakespeare, but they doubt the scripture. There's a conspiracy against truth. You just better understand that. 
And so what I'm going to show you tonight is documented. You have more evidence of what I'm going to show you tonight than Shakespeare ever being alive. But what has happened, it has been slandered. It has been marked off until we have been pushed into the back, it seems. But I feel a breaking coming out. I feel a revival taking place. That's why Azusa was so important because it was somebody kicking a door open in, in then Elton, Louisiana. And I want to take you through some things and show you God has always had a people. In your history class, you, you may remember, didn't seem very important at the time and you never figured the preacher would talk about it, but there was this thing called the Roman Inquisition. And it took on other names. There was the Portuguese Inquisition and there was the Spanish Inquisition and then there was the French. And, and it, it took on different forms wherever it was. It was... It was a pretty big deal related to our DNA because what it did do is it was able to thin out the ranks of Jesus' name apostolic believers. And there was what was called the auto de fe, which was, this was what they would take you they would grab you and say, okay, you're one of these heretics. You don't espouse the doctrine of the Trinity and you refuse to be baptized. And we'll get into how all that developed in a little bit. But they would take, it was called the auto de fe. And they would take them and they would publicly, they would sometimes, oftentimes, humiliate them by stripping them naked before the city. Take them to the town square, strip them naked. And then after they would, they would either recant or they would take a stand, and there, after their public humiliation, they would be oftentimes burned at the stake. And through the years, there were massive numbers of apostolic believers that were killed, or many, for the sake of their children or whatever, stepped back away. And others went into what we would call the underground church movement, went into hiding, churches in catacombs, churches in backwoods meetings, and uh, it became a very secretive thing, often case. And then what writings had been there were often burned and destroyed and because it was labeled as heresy. And, uh, but but here's, what, here's what you got to remember about apostolic doctrine. You don't have to have books, schools, Cathedrals are political positions. For apostolic doctrine to survive, all you got to have is one preacher. And wherever there was one apostolic preacher, it didn't matter if they took the books or they took the, the families and they killed this one. If there was one man or woman of God that could open up their mouth and preach, there was a remnant and the gospel continued. Let me just tell you today in my little lab coat and tell you, deep in the DNA of apostolic believers is a preached word of God. Faith cometh by hearing and hearing by the word of God. That's why it's important that I hear the word of God. Take the building. Take my family. Take my job. Take my car. But don't take the word of God. Preacher, preach to me. That's all I need. As long as somebody will preach truth, you can't stop the apostolic church. Amen. Constantine tried it. Theodosius tried it. Justinian tried it. Charlemagne tried it. But they could not stop the apostolic church. When I say apostolic church and I talk about apostolic doctrine, I'm talking about Jesus' name, baptism, and the infilling of the Holy Ghost. And let me remind you, there has never been one day since Acts chapter 2 that that apostolic message has been silent. But even further, let me show you something. There's never been a day that has not been fought. And don't think just because there's not somebody else trying to stretch you up on the side of a wall that that message is not being fought today. We are still in a fight for apostolic doctrine. And it's important to understand that apostolic doctrine does not digress. There is no further revelation. There is no more ascendant thinking. The moment you leave apostolic doctrine, you become something else. 
Did you get that? When you morph or change or add to or take away, you cease to be apostolic. That's why it's important that you understand all of the history books and all of the church history and the church fathers. If they did not preach what Acts chapter 2 was about and the apostles' doctrine, they were something else. They were not the apostolic church. Doesn't matter if it was your grandma, your aunt, or your great-great-grandfather. The apostolic church was what happened in Acts chapter 2 in the apostles' doctrine. Now, biblical Christianity did not, this is important, because I'm showing you the process of what happened over the last 2,000 years. The apostolic church, everybody say apostolic church, did not, say it, did not become Romanized. The reason that is important is because there are even history books that will reveal that the early church fathers baptized in Jesus' name, but changed in 325 A.D. at the Council of Nicaea. But don't believe that. The apostolic church did not change its form of baptism. The Roman church changed the form of baptism. That's an important thing for you to understand. What, what happened to the apostolic church did not go through this changing process and then come back in 1906. See, that's what some people want you to believe. They, they want you to think that it made this long journey through Rome and then came back and, and then there was revelation. The Holy Ghost was finally poured out again. Uh, but that's not what happened. The apostolic church has never changed. Scholars, you may see this as you're studying. Scholars refer to the primitive Judaic Christianity. Prim- primitive Judaic Christianity. That's a term you'll see scholars. What that is, is that's code word for apostolic believers. Because Judaic indicates what? Monotheism. The Jews, one God. The first commandment was what? Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God is. So when they refer these scholars you're reading and you're finding out about the primitive, they, they try to put us, you know, the yeah, we are primitive. We're going all the way back. We're organic. I, you're looking at a guy that's proud and happy and glad to be a primitive Judaic Christian because I'm going back. I'm a monotheist. I believe in one God and only one God. Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God is one Lord. The church that Christ established was birthed in Jerusalem. Now, that's important. Everybody say Jerusalem. The church you're a part of did not start in Rome. It started in Jerusalem. Primitive Judaic Christianity. Have you ever thought about who the 12 apostles were? They were all Jews. Jerusalem was the holy city. It was was the place of worship. It was the place, the holy city of God. It It was that Hebrew system of one God worship that that God would establish his church in and out of. It had a one God foundation. Now, this is our DNA. One God, monotheist, this is where we come from. But something happened. There arose alongside of what I would call the Mediterranean Greek Latin priesthood. There arose a form of worship that was an amalgamation of historical idolatry and a few things I'll show you here that was almost like a melting pot or emerging, like pour it all in the cauldron, stir it up, and, and we will somehow merge the power of Rome and its political might and its many gods so, in 313, this cat on the screen, his name is Constantine, he made it the religio lacita, which means the legal religion, the official religion of the Roman Empire. This mixing. And 1 Kings chapter 16 tells the story of a guy by the name of Ahab and Jezebel. You remember them. Uh, and, and, and I can give you, a, I haven't read a text yet, so you're saying, well, you're not preaching. Well, now you'll think I preach because I'm going to give you a text. 
Ahab and Jezebel made Baal worship the official religion of that day. And by doing so, everybody that was opposed was now illegal. And so that's what Elijah, that was the whole that was the whole conflict was here was now a legal where the government was now uh, at odds with true doctrine. And because it was legal, you had all of this stuff, this fighting, this, this, this system where there's a setup for the great conflict. And, and, but I got to remind you of something. Just like in the days of Ahab and Jezebel, you remember Elijah's all distraught about it. And God says, I got 7,000 you don't even know about. I got 7,000 prophets that have never bowed their knee to Baal. And can I remind everybody that when Constantine came in and said, now the official religion is the Roman Catholic Church and all of these things, I want to remind somebody, just like in 1 Kings, there was thousands of people that never bowed their knee to Rome. There was an apostolic truth that went all the way from Acts chapter 2. There were groups. There were the Petropassians. Petra means father you know like patriarch patra passions passion where they understood the father and the son were not separate they didn't believe the doctrine of the trinity so they became known as the patra passions they said the father suffered that was a whole group of people that that have been marked off as a bunch of heretics and a bunch of nuts that you know they're so primitive in their judaic this is a this is a group of thousands of people that did not ascribe to the Roman doctrine. Then there were what were called the modalistic monarchians, monarchy, that there was one king, that there was one ruler, that there was one God, and, and that there were, there, were, there were this large group, and this would have influence that would span continents. Then there were a group that are also known as the Sabellians, and the doctrine of Sabellianism. And uh, we may have a, I think you got a slide of, Sibelius. Sibelius was a guy that he stood up in this day and he refused the doctrine of the Trinity. He said it's false doctrine. He baptized in the name of Jesus. And so there was a whole following of him. And, and then it multiplied and it, it, it went around the world at that time. And then there were what were called the North African apostolics that traced their roots all the way back to the Ethiopian eunuch that Philip had witnessed to. And then there were the Donatists. And then there were Marcionites, and those, those were the ones that Polycarp, Polycarp got so mad. St. Polycarp got so mad one day that he confronted this guy. And, and don't believe all the history you read about some of these people. They, they've, they've embellished it and changed all kinds of things. But, but at the essence, the deeper you dig, you find out these people were really taking a stand over Jesus' name baptism. And over the mighty God in Christ, and that there was only one Lord. And so Polycarp got so mad one day, he confronted him and screamed in front of the whole council. He said, you are the son of Satan. Because he would not espouse the doctrine of the Trinity. You can find that in Neander's writing on page 294 or 291. I got proof for all this, okay? Then there, well, this one, you want to get real out there? Let's go way out there. I mean, we already been to the White House with, with... Emily Todd, let, let's go even weirder. Has anybody ever heard of the Ebionites? Nobody. The Ebionite Christians. Well, have you ever heard of the Essenes? Somebody said, yeah. Or the community of Qumran. Anybody ever heard of that? The community of Qumran's where they found the Dead Sea Scrolls. You ever heard of the Dead Sea Scrolls? I've been to the, I've been to the Qumran community and seen up in those caves, and, and you've seen the Dead Sea Scrolls. Well, the, the Essenes, that's where John the Baptist grew up, in that it was a very staunch, very hard line, very separated, very isolated. They were hard-nosed, okay? They were, they were the people that were separated and godly and holy above everybody else. It was this, and they were marked as, you know, the, you know, the Essene group, the Qumran community, and Well, what happened after Jerusalem fell and time goes by, the descendants of the Essenes became what were known as Ebionite Christians. The Ebionite Christians remained so much in isolation, and isolation is never good because when it's just you and you're not growing and you're not connected with people, things happen. and they, They began to form all kinds of weird doctrines, but one of their fundamental doctrines was that there was only one God. They went back to their primitive Judaic Christianity. But the interesting thing was there was a lady 
whose name was Khadijah or Khadijah, who happened to be the first wife of a guy named Muhammad. You've heard of Muhammad, right? Well, her uncle, or he was a half uncle, his name Wakara, was an Ebionite Christian as she was. She was 40 years old, Muhammad was 25. By the time they got married, Akaijah was kind of out there and had added all of these things. But the one thing that remained was she was a believer in only one God. She had a tremendous, she was very wealthy. She had a tremendous influence. And many people say she was the one that formed uh, Muhammad's idea for the whole, along with his drunken state and all the other women he married, all of this stuff formed his theology. But what was interesting was what you may have studied in history in college or maybe in high school was the covenant of Umar. Anybody ever heard of the covenant of Umar? Umar. That was a covenant where uh, Muhammad's followers said, we will not kill all the Christians. And they would not kill the Jews. The covenant of Umar, there, there's a copy of it right there. That was a covenant, and the reason was because they understood, because of their Ebionite Christian background that Khadijah had brought through, and that was deep in them and was even connected into Muhammad. He would, he would, add, he would enter into a covenant of some sort, the covenant of Umar, not to kill the Christians. But he killed the Catholics. And he said, because they are not Christian. Why? Because he understood that Christianity only had one God. So now we're really out there. What I'm showing you is the influence of the one God message is not some late development. You are a part of the apostolic church that is primitive Judaic Christianity, its roots go all the way back to Acts chapter 2. By the year 8 AD 55, there were 8 million Jews in the world. They say that one out of every 10 people in the Roman Empire was a Jew. And what was amazing is that 1 million of those Jews had converted to Christianity. But they had not converted to Roman Christianity. They had converted to what we would call primitive Judaic Christianity. Monotheistic in its belief. They were tongue talkers. They were Jesus' name baptizers. city of Antioch, which was in Syria, became a great center of apostolic life. And it's important that you get this because I'm I'm showing you what happened over the last 2,000 years. What's the very first thing that happens after the 120 get the Holy Ghost? It explodes out the building, right? And 3,000 people, and if you go back to Acts chapter 2 and you read about all the people that are there, they're from all over the place. So the very first thing you learn about the apostolic church is it's not for us four and no more. It it blows out the room and it fills all the streets and all of these 3,000 people which are scattered from all over, guess what happened? The apostolic gospel, the very first event of Holy Ghost outpouring and the first message of Jesus' name baptism preached went to the whole world. In fact, he said it's going to begin in Jerusalem and Judea and Samaria and the uttermost. And he said, for all of them that are far off, even as many. And so it's important that you understand that God birthed this kingdom on a feast day, a celebration where people had come all together and the gospel begins to spread. And then it's 6,000. And then then it's spreading on. And then the Bible just has to say multitudes begin to receive the Holy Ghost and begin to receive this baptism. So it's important that you understand the apostolic church was missional. It didn't just hang around on this block. So you've got Rome's worship of Rome and Rome's worship of Caesar. They were obsessed with object worship. They were obsessed with what you could physically do. They were obsessed with what you could physically have and possess and what you could give. And and they would literally bankrupt everything to feed the masses of Rome so that they could get elected. Boy, some things never change, do they? And they would display the might. You know, everybody, this Occupy stuff, everybody talking about the Occupy. You know who they need to be occupying? They got the NBA fighting. What are they making? Millions of dollars? Why don't they go park on the front door of the Sacramento Kings? Well, how'd I get off on that? But it's the same thing. That's what they were doing. That's what they were doing in the Roman Colosseum. It was it was promotion of self. It was, self. It was the promotion of what do you have for me now? And what can you give me? And I, all of this stuff and, and all of these false doctrines and all of these false gods. So in the middle of Rome's power and might, the primitive Judaic Christians refused to bow to the idolatry of Rome. They refused to participate 
in the gladiator sport. Some of you didn't know that. They refused. They refused to run naked in the races. When they would pass the Roman Colosseum, history says, the Christians would cover their eyes. They refused to bend to the culture around them. And so what was issued, they call it a billet. A billet was an statement that you had presented. It was proof that you had made your offering to the gods of Rome. And if you did not have your billet, then you could be imprisoned or you could be taken and thrown to the lion. And so what happened, these Judaic primitive Christians, they refused and so they were ruled religio illicita, which means they were the illegal religion. So these primitive apostolic believers that would not bow to the idolatry and would not participate in all of the the issues around them, that's one dynamic that's taking place. Now let's jump back to philosophy. Anybody ever heard a guy by the name of Plato? Plato had developed what he called Timaeus. Timaeus was this story that he told. It had four people, and one of the lead characters was Timaeus. But, but uh, Timaeus, go ahead and put that next slide up there. He, he created this, and I don't know how good you can see it up there, but he created this whole, he glamorized the numbers and he he tried to establish all of these things about life and reality and he made these diagrams and he put things together it was called the geometry of the sphere and it became the magical idea of religion and in it he glamorized in Timaeus he glamorized the number three he said there are three things there's air wind and water and he called it the elaborate celestial arithmetic This is all prior to Acts chapter 2. This is the philosophy that's moving through the day. So you've got Roman culture that has now said, if you don't bow and pay your billet to the gods, you'll be in prison. So meanwhile, you've got the growth of Plato's philosophy and the glamorization of the number three of earth, wind, and water and the celestial arithmetic and the whole Logos myth and the basis for the idea of the Trinity. And it was natural to go to the next slide. It came out of Timaeus. It began to have because it was celestial. It it described reality. It described everything that was celestial. It it described everything about man. After all, man is a tripartite being and everything was about three. And so all of the merging of philosophy and false gods, all all of this is playing at one time. It wasn't wasn't like somebody woke up one morning and said, as of now, there's a trinity. No, it was a development of Rome's false doctrine and and Plato's philosophy and the Greek influence and and, and, and the merging of, uh, of idolatrous priesthood merging with some idea from Judaism and now with Pentecostalism or whatever they called it then, is there a way to pour it all together? Timaeus was also played into the idea of the Roman triad of deity, which was Uni, Tinea, and Minerva, which was called the pantheon of the gods. So you had the platonic polytheistic elements that provided the building blocks of what would become the official religion of an idolatrous Rome. But now you have official Rome and its law along now with religion. And the two are merged. And religion now becomes the agency of the state. So you have what becomes persecution on the apostolic church from the outside. You've got now an idolatrous Roman government that has ruled with a rod of iron that has now merged its law and its philosophy and its idolatrous worship into an official religion that begins to press against the apostolic church. Everybody say, that's the pressure from without. A.D. 66, a man by the name of Jude wrote in his book, you happen to have that book, The third verse, put that slide up there for me. Jude, verse number three and verse number four. Beloved, when I gave all diligence to write unto you of the common salvation, it was needful for me to write unto you and exhort you that you should earnestly contend for the faith which was once, everybody say once. In other words, he's saying faith is not to be added to. 
Doctrine is not to be added to. We're in, we're in AD 66 right here. This is already happening. Plato's philosophy and the persecution of Rome has started. It's pressure from without. He said that faith was once delivered into the saints. You don't need to be changing it. Don't be adding anything to it. Go to verse number four. For there are certain men crept in unawares who were before of old ordained to this condemnation, ungodly men, turning the grace of our God into lasciviousness and denying the only Lord God and our Lord Jesus Christ. Maybe the scripture means a little more to you now that you see the setting that Jude is writing in. They're getting all the pressure from the outside. But now he said, I want to warn you, church, you're not just facing Rome and the billet that you've been made, made an illegal religion, but you are now also battling with spirits and evil, grievous men that have come into the church and they're wanting to, they're, they're wanting to pervert the doctrine of the only Lord God. So now you've got a setting where you've got persecution not only from without, you've got persecution and deception moving from within. Then add to the equation. See, these things don't mean a lot to us because we're on Sunday night and wanting to shout, but it makes sense when you start realizing there was division in the church that began to happen between the Jewish believers and the Gentile believers. Anybody ever notice that in the Bible? There, there was this division and, and people wouldn't sit with those because they were Jews. And they wouldn't sit with the den, Gentiles. And then they were, they were freaked out. My God, they, you mean the Gentiles can get the Holy Ghost like us? And there was this division in the church. So now you've got persecution without. Now you've got, you've got deception within. And now you've got this, this rift running in the church between the Jews and the Gentiles. And then there were these ones that came in and began to sow discord among, among the body. They begin to add to the doctrine Greek philosophy. 2 Timothy, put it up on the screen, chapter 1, verse 15. These scriptures make sense when you understand what the apostles were dealing with. This thou knowest, that all they which are in Asia be turned away from me. Now think about this. There had been a revival that had swept through, but in about 12 to 15 years, Paul Paul writes to Timothy and he said that all they which were at Asia, he's talking about Asia Minor, would be turned away from me, of whom are some weird dude and another one's weird name. Something's happened. There's been a turning because there's been pressure from without, pressure from within, and people are sowing discord. And Paul and the apostles are watching as many begin to defect because of personal expediency. 1 John chapter 2, verse 19, I think I gave you that. They went out from us. Remember this scripture? They went out from us, but they were not of us. For had they been of us, they would no doubt have continued with us. But they went out that they might be made manifest that they were not all of us. What he's saying is, this group really didn't believe primitive Judaic Christianity. They're adding to it. They're, they're, they're following the way of Rome. They're following the way of Plato. They're following the official religion because of personal experience. He said, they're really not of us. Look at 1 Timothy chapter 1, 20. There was personal, well, I'm not going to get a good deal here, so I'm going to find another way. Of whom is Hymenaeus and Alexander, of whom I delivered unto Satan, that they may, le- that they may learn not to blaspheme. In other words, they've been searching out their own way and let them go so they can figure it out. These people went away from the service to the body and entered into this new idea of Greek philosophy and false religion. The idea came of they wanted a priesthood. The book of Revelation, the reason it's important that I give you these dates, Jude 66 and AD 66, is the book of Revelation was written, scholars believe, around A.D. 95 or A.D. 96. So now we're 30 years after when John's seeing the vision of write the things which thou hast seen and things that are and the things which shall be hereafter. And he writes about the seven churches of Asia. What he's writing was prophetic, but he was also writing over at least 60 years of what had happened in the church. And whole studies about what each of those churches went through. And sure, it was prophetic and it was, it was a type and it was a shadow of what was going to be revealed that would happen in the church. But look at what Paul says in Acts chapter 29 and verse 30. He said, grievous wolves. Wolves have come into the church. They've come in and they're, they're devouring, they're ravening beasts. They're not sparing the flock. 
Something's happening in the church. There's pressure without. There's pressure within. And it's happening in our day, he's saying. So you got the political influence of Rome, the desire for acceptability, and Demas hath forsaken me, having loved this present world. He wanted to fit in with everybody around him, and this was the common thing of the day. Nothing new in our world. This was happening in AD 96, and there was the pursuit of self-interest. It became the springboard for apostate doctrine. So, get the picture. Here's the ingredients. We're making an apostate cake. Celestial arith- arithmetic of Plato the political influence of Rome, the official religion of the state, severe persecution without, grievous wolves from within, and you have the perfect recipe for a false church. But before you get depressed and throw in the towel and say, oh well, I got to remind you, in spite of all that, Brother Huffstetler, there was still an apostolic church. In fact, remember in the Old Testament, he said, Joseph told his brother, he said, what you meant for evil, God meant for good. The persecution by Rome on the primitive Judaic Christians that refused to bow their knee to Rome's idols and the pantheon of gods because they knew there's only one God. And they knew that Jesus Christ was the revelation of the mighty God in Christ, the expressed image of the invisible God. And they knew that when the full, that when you got Jesus, you got all the fullness of the Godhead bodily. And they took a stand. And when they took a stand, the very blows of persecution Do you know that the church of Jerusalem was 150,000 believers? Can you imagine a rock church, 150,000 believers? The church in Jerusalem was 150,000 believers before persecution hit. Persecution hit the church and what happened? All these thousands of people, they're running for their lives. They're going to the catacombs. They're getting on ships and going around the world. They wind up in Tunisia. They wind up in China. They, They wind up around the world. Guess what happened? The gospel was in their hands. Remember when he said in the fullness of time, when the, when, and then another place said when the, when the day of Pentecost was fully come, indicating that God had a plan. He was getting it all ready. Why? He brought it to the point where Greek was the accepted language of the world. It was the, it was the official language. And, and Rome's might and power had built highways that had never been there. Trade routes open up. And then persecution comes. God's just sitting back saying, you meant it for evil, but I'm meaning it for good. So here it is, 150,000 start splitting up and heading around the world. What the devil meant to destroy was the thing that carried the gospel that missional acts to revival went around the world feel the holy ghost right now i'm glad to be a part of an apostolic primitive judaic christianity i'm one god from the top of my head to the sole of my feet well i'm excited about this by ad 88 and this is documented wm langer in his uh work biblical archaeology review page 134 He said the gospel by A.D. 88 was already taken to China. Think about that. The book of Revelation was written in 96 A.D. And 10 years before John the Revelator on Isle of Patmos, the gospel had already made it to China. Quote, Chinese Lieutenant K. Can Ying penetrated to the Persian Gulf. Quote, there he encountered Peter's doctrine. He or some of his men imported it to China. What the devil meant for evil, God was taking the gospel. God, that's why he said the the nations are as the drop of a bucket. You look at everything that's going on in the world. Let me just tell you, God's got it all in control. Where it looks like everything's going crazy, there's an apostolic revival at work. God's doing something. Don't you go to bed afraid tonight. Go to bed and say, God, what are you doing? When I look at Drudge or I pick up the paper, you're up to something. They don't know it, but you do. One of my favorite studies you've heard me preach about Joseph of Arimathea also with him was Simon the Zealot they landed at Glastonbury England trade routes the seller of tin the Roman trade route it opened up and the first church of England was established they they say in 42 AD do you have a do you have a picture of the Glastonbury chapel that's the remains of what they believe to be the very first church in England that they date back to 42 AD. Joseph of Arimathea was the most celebrated uh, biblical character of medieval history in England. 
King Arthur and Guinevere are, are buried at Glastonbury Chapel. They all wanted to be identified with the guy that gave up his tomb for Jesus to resurrect. I've been to the garden tomb. Let me see, Andy, you been to the garden tomb. Y'all that were there with us, remember the guy that met you at the gate? He wasn't a Jew, he wasn't a Palestinian. He was from Great Britain. I heard him speaking, that English broke. I said, I said, hey, you're from England? He said, yes. As I began to discuss with him, guess who owns that garden? The British government owns that garden. Palestinians don't own it. The Jews don't own it. The Americans don't own it. Great Britain owns that garden. That's their property. And when you go there, you'll be met by a great uh, British guide because they trace their lineage all the way back to Joseph of Arimathea. And they say the first church, there's a picture of it. A guy by the name of E.T. Thompson wrote, through the ages. He said that the gospel spread through the British Isles, and I quote, this is, this is from Neander, page 47. The gospel, quote, leapt the English Channel and was planted in Languedoc, Frisia, and Saxony well before 96 AD. There are over, Pastor Singh's not here, but there are over 40 documented histories that tell of a man, a saint they call him now, a disciple of Jesus Christ by the name of Thomas who came to Malabar, India. Philip and the Ethiopian eunuch, Acts chapter 8, the gospel went to Ethiopia. To this day, do you know that to this day, the Trinitarian doctrine has never taken a hold in Ethiopia. The Coptic church, you heard about the Coptic church that are being persecuted in Egypt right now? They don't believe in the Trinity. And they've had a huge influence. But if you follow their history back, they started as monotheistic believers. AD 12, 84, I quote, Ursinus, an African, the Synod of Namors asserted, this is 1284, everybody say 1284, that water baptism in the name of Jesus Christ alone was valid. There's always been an apostolic message. Okay, let's talk about Africa. We've been to England, we've been to India, we've been to France, we've been to Frisia, we've been, now let's go to North Africa. There were many Jewish Christians and Gentile Christians in the place called Carthage, which is now, we would know, in the area of Tunisia, which was in the news. There was a guy there by the name of Donatus. Now, he has been slandered, he has been written about, he has been called a heretic and everything else under the sun. I quote Augustine, the great church father, The clouds roll with thunder that the house of the Lord shall be built throughout the earth. And there these frogs sit in their marsh and croak. We are the only Christian. He couldn't stand Donatist. He said, the reason he couldn't stand him, he said, you're like a frog quoting because you think you're the only people that say because you're a one God people and you don't believe the Trinity. And it ticked him off. He made fun of him. He began to slander him. That, that's, that's him right there. That's Donatus. This was, this was a man that refused to bow his knee to the Romanization of the church. And that man would have such an influence in his area of Tunisia and beyond that he would lead over 400 bishops in Africa and Asia Minor. They were labeled as heretics and he, and Augustine, they are, said there are heretics and they should be beat with rods. And he said they had not Christ. And then he said, here's the reason. And this is quote, think about this. He said, had not Christ by great violence coerced Paul into Christianity? He used what happened to Paul on the road to Damascus as a biblical reason to go in and beat Donatus and his followers. So the branches of primitive Christianity could be seen. The year was 177 A.D. I'm almost done. Another one of those church historians by the name of Irenaeus arrived in Lyon, France. Quote, He saw nations without paper and ink that had through the Holy Ghost, this is Irenaeus' words, through the Holy Ghost, the words of salvation in their heart. Because remember what I told you, the apostolic, you you can tear our cathedrals down, 
You can destroy our books. But if we got one Holy Ghost preacher that'll preach the truth, he said, we got there. They didn't have paper or ink, but they had the Holy Ghost. In my office from my master studies, I was given quotes where he said, here, here it was in, in the, in the uh, second century. He arrives, he said, when we got to Germany, he said, we found believers in Christ before we ever got there. It infuriated him to see these tongue-talking, oneness believers that refused to bow to the Romanization of the church. See, France, under this apostolic message, had such a revival. Malak Martin, in his book, Three Popes and the Cardinal, on page 75, said that because of this, there were 50 men that were slaughtered in a massacre because of their refusal to accept the Romanization of the church. It was an area known as Languedoc, France, southern France. Oldenburg and J.H. Blunt, I quote, this part of France became a stronghold for non-Catholic Christians, particularly for monotheistic inclined apostolics. It grew so much, thousands were being baptized in Jesus' name. The reason you don't read about it is because their books were destroyed. And very little survived. But what did survive proves my message. They were known as the Albigensians. They covered ten centuries in the south of France. Ten centuries. The apostolic doctrine grew and was preached in the south of France until what was known as the Tolson Inquisition, led by a priest named Dominic under the leadership of Pope, Pope Innocent III in 1208, led a crusade against the religion, and one million of them were slaughtered. Page 229, J. Locke's A.D. 177, Southern Germany was already Christianized, but without Rome's ecclesiastical organization. I've just given you a brief uh, moving through Africa, England, France, Germany, the south of France, even India and beyond. The gospel was working. On another track, Christians had been labeled religious uh, illicit. They had been made illegal. Claudius in Rome banished Christians from Rome, A.D. 53. The gospel began to spread and begin to go underground. They were labeled as, as high treason. It was high treason if you were part of this modalistic group of people that only believed in one God. Peter would be called and labeled the number one propagator. You remember that? He's the preacher. He gets arrested. I just preached about it the other night. The doors swing open. The angel comes delivering. The people are praying. But have you ever noticed that's the last thing you hear about Peter? Other than one conversation where they're gathering together with the general conference where they're going to get together and talk about the church and Peter speaks up. But the Bible tells you in Acts chapter 12 and verse 17 that Peter went to another place. You get more insight later on in 1 Peter 5 and 13 indicates where he was and Peter greets them and he says the church that is at Babylon. He's writing to them. It's where Peter went. He disappears from the, from the book of Acts and, except for one comment that he makes at the general conference because he's out spreading the gospel, the doctrine of Peter. And where does he go? I love this little thing. Maybe I'll preach about this sometime. Abraham leaves the Ur of the Chaldees but a Holy Ghost filled Peter goes right back to that same area with the gospel. It's another subject, but look how the gospel is spreading. Syria, we're almost done. Dura Europas. 1928, you can put that slide up there, Ashley. 1928, the French Academy of Inscription and Yale University discovered a pre-Constantinian baptistry. That's it. You can't see it good on, on the screen, but there is a mural that is there. And the mural in the baptistry is of the tomb of Christ. And inscribed is this statement, one God in heaven. They were labeled heretics, they were persecuted, their writings were destroyed, but all they needed was a preacher. Trevor Roper in The Rise of Christian Europe, page 59, he gives the painting of a guy named Mani, who was also M-A-N-I, who also was a man that refused to ascribe to the Trinity. 276 A.D., Mani was labeled a heretic. His skin was flayed while he was alive. His busted open skin was filled with straw, and he was fastened to the gates of the city. 
All because he would not bow a knee to the doctrine of Rome. Page 15, Mr. Runciman said, Monty was a Jew of Iran. Marcion and Monty were modalist monarchians baptized in Jesus' name and baptized in that mode of baptism. If you go to Roper's book, he describes on page 59, there is a painting of this man named Monty and there are people gathered around and tongues of fire are upon their heads. Heretics by some, but Pentecostals to others. He's always had a church. Marco Polo, 1265 to 1323, that conqueror, you know, made it all the way to China. He got there and found not Roman Christianity, but he found what he called Monarchian. After this leader, Mani, Institute of Coptic Studies and Middle East Studies University of Utah, his name is A.S. Atiyah, page 260, said, By St. Thomas also with the Ethiopians had turned to the truth that St. Thomas had gone to the kingdom of the height among the Chinese and that the Indians and the Chinese bring worship and commemoration of Thomas to thy name. Tia also wrote about Vasco da Gama. Put his picture up there. 1498, this guy rolled into Malabar, India. He brought havoc there. He tried to forth, force Catholicism upon the area of Malabar, India. Apostolic records were destroyed, their churches were burned, and masses of believers were slaughtered in the year 1500. You can document that on his writing. Atiyah's writing, page 366 through 368. My point tonight is to show you that the apostolic church did not begin in 1906. It did not begin in Elton, Louisiana. It did not begin in 1980 in West Sacramento. The church that you are a part of is a part of a group of people that never bowed their knee to the Romanization of the apostolic message. When we talk about apostolic doctrine, we're talking about a church whose DNA goes all the way to Acts chapter 2 in Jerusalem. We still believe, hear, O Israel, the Lord our God is one Lord. We still, in our DNA study tonight, we still believe in the DNA of Jesus' name baptism. In the name of Jesus Christ, in water, repentance of your sins, and ye shall receive the gift of the Holy Ghost evidence by speaking in other tongues. We're primitive Christianity. We're organic to the core. No additives. No additives. We're not adding to because when you add to, you cease to be apostolic. But you're looking at one DNA expert tonight that searched it out and studied it out. I'll cling to the book. I'll cling to the Apostle Peter's message. I'm a one God apostolic tongue.